Good morning. We will, uh, we're going to begin a study on the minor prophets. And if you're interested, the, the book that we're kind of focusing on is, uh, it may be more difficult to find, but it's a little book called The Minor Prophets by Jack Lewis. Jack Lewis is a uh, Church of Christ. Um, I'm going to call him a theologian. The man's brilliant. He has his doctorate from Harvard. And then he also has a, a degree from Hebrew Union, which is the premier, one of the premier universities for biblical studies. So he's a genius of a man. Um, but we're going to spend some time. Basically, we're going to follow the outline that his book provides. Um, and then for today, the, the focus is going to be on an introduction. So I'm going to hopefully get you just an overall introduction to the time period. And after we get kind of a general introduction to the time period, we're going to start next week. Mike's got uh, Amos next week. And so we'll go from Amos um, on. But I've got some uh, stuff that I want to share from. It'll come from Dr. Lewis's book, but also some material that um, I'm going to add in for today so that we have a, at least a decent introduction to the minor prophets. Uh, and so as we as we kind of start, I do want us to, to highlight the, the reality of the prophets. Um, and particular today, I find it interesting, and, and you may be one of those people. If you are, congratulations. I'm going to talk about you for a second. Um, often, people look to the Bible to predict future events. Um, right now, people are looking and saying, well, it's the end of, it's the end of time. There's wars and rumors of wars. There's There's... I don't know what all they're, they're saying that, you know, I, I don't follow that group. So I'm, I'm a little ignorant of it, but they'll look and they'll say, well, look, we, we see this prophesied about in Revelation. We see this prophesied in the book of Daniel. We see this prophesied here. And, and I think it's important to realize that when we talk about the prophets. I'm not going to project that on the prophets. Other other teachers may. and That's their prerogative. But. I don't know if Joel was writing about 2022 America when Joel wrote his book. The same goes for Malachi. I don't know if Malachi was envisioning 2020, 2030 America when he wrote. So when we come to the prophets, minor or major prophets, we first have to realize that we're not going to come to them with the expectation that they're going to tell me what's happening today. That's not the, the objective that I'm going to follow. What I do follow, though, is that Joel or Malachi or Habakkuk, or in the words, the way Greg calls it, Habakkuk, um, you know, however you want to, that when we come to these books, we're going to come to them with this approach that says, what was the author saying to the initial audience? Uh, Joel was writing to a group of people. Let me look it up real quick for Joel's time period. Joel was probably writing in the 19th, in the ninth century, the 19th, the ninth century, which would put him somewhere around probably the eight, let's just say eight thirties um, is probably the time period of, of Joel. Um, that's an assumption. Joel is one of the books that we don't actually know when it was written. It could have been a ninth century or it could have been a fifth century book. We don't know. But you have to realize that in Joel's writing or in any of the minor prophets, we first start with who they were writing to directly. And once we have a better understanding of the world that they were writing to, then we take the message that they wrote and we say, OK, what's like it in our world today? Well, you know, Malachi focuses on the priesthood a lot. Malachi is looking at a, at a priesthood that is insufficient, inadequate, and is saying, look, how do you get godly? Well, if we're to make that a modern application, just very simply, a modern application is, isn't the church, are we all called priests? We're all a priesthood of believers. That's a, a, a pinnacle of the restoration, restoration movement is that there's a priesthood of all believers. We're all priests within that, that church. And Malachi's call is for priests to be holy. That's kind of a nutshell of the, of the book. 
Well, how would I make that today? Oh man, maybe we as a church are called to a level of holiness. So when we're in the priest, when we're in the book, we first start with what was the original audience? What was their message? And then after that, we say, what's the message to me today? The only time you can trump that is if Jesus or Paul or a New Testament author quotes it and says, boy, this is what they meant. You know, that happens with Joel. Joel's actually quoted it in a, in a form of looking forward to the spirit coming. So then it's, well, you have a commentary then of what the book was written about. But all of these were written by inspired men um, to carry on a message that God found valuable and important for the day. First Timothy, or Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 tells us that all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for, for such things. And when he says all scripture, he wasn't talking about the book of Luke. Scripture for them was the Old Testament. So as we kind of begin, as we kind of get an introduction here, um, I do want to cover, uh, Dr. Lewis has seven principles of prophecy that we want to, I want to make sure we're kind of all founded on and we're all grounded to. And after that, I've got a few more points and then I'll make, I have five concluding points that I'll make on what I find in, in the major or the minor prophets that will be of great value. The first one, a prophet is a man who is moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, this was not Tom, Dick and Harry showing up writing a book. And that somehow it got carried along and put in the book. This is a, uh, we do believe in the inspiration of scriptures. And I trust that everything within our Bibles is part of that inspiration. There are other books that we come across that are going to be in these time periods. Uh, apocryphal books. If you've been a part of my class on a Wednesday night on the Apocrypha, um, you're going to know that, that some of the apocryphal books come in this time period. We do not generally take those as the same inspired level as what we put here. Now, apocryphal, there's pseudepigraphal, there's other books that we could follow, but the prophets we're going to study today are ones that we are taking that they are uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Second, a prophet cannot introduce a strange religion. If a prophet's going to be a prophet, what does that mean they have to do? Law. They've got to follow the law. They're not going to come along and bring something new, something different. They're going to be, if anything, attempting to call people back to what the law uh, that God instituted through Moses is going to focus on. Now, Moses writes about this in Deuteronomy chapter 13. If you care to look that up, you're welcome to. But it's Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, where the law in the book of Deuteronomy would share that a prophet is one who does not introduce newness in religion. They're one who do, does not introduce a strange religion. They're a person who brings about what God has called people to do. If a prophet or a dreamer, this is Deuteronomy 13, 1. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, a sign and wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet. Um, and that could continue on in that passage. So prophet will bring only what is focused from the law. Um, third, a true prophet will always, their oracles, their, their teachings will come true. Um, I think Mike and I actually talked about this a week or two ago. We were, we were talking about some of the modern day prophets. And that was the point that, that, that Mike reminded me of then is he said, you know, a prophet is a person who even in today's world, you got people who will stand up and say, well, I'm a prophet. You ever see any of those on TV? Well, one of the tests of a prophet is that their words come true. How many people have said, you know, oh, well, the world's going to end in 1978. Oh, the world's going to end in 2032. You know, we, we can go about all these things about when the world's going to end, but if a prophet's oracle does not come true, then the question is posed, are they really a prophet? Um, the time period of the prophets 
is basically focused around the Assyrian and the Babylonian period. And so there are threats of destruction and calamity, but there's also a return to a promise made by God. And Zechariah will remind the post-exilic people that the threats against their fathers were fulfilled. Basically what this means is that this kind of gives us a time period that we're dealing with in our Bibles. You know, when, when we look at our Old Testament, it's a little daunting at times because there's a lot of stuff there. And your Old Testament is two thirds the size of your New Testament. So it's, it's a lot of stuff. However, when we break the Old Testament timeline down, it's really a pretty simple message. You go at the book of Genesis and what does the book of Genesis tell us? In the beginning. In the beginning. It starts, and that's literally the word Genesis is the beginning. So we start with the book of Genesis and in the beginning. And as you go through Genesis, who are we introduced to? Think of some of the key figures in the book of Genesis. Adam, Noah. Adam, Noah. Abram. Abram, who becomes Abraham. What happens? You get a little ways past Abraham. Who do we get to? Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Now, Now, what happens to Joseph here? And once we get through Joseph, we get slavery in Egypt. Now, are we now what book are we in? Exodus. So, so, see, in that few moments, we've covered all of Genesis. We're now in the Exodus, and what's the book of Exodus about? You can always remember that because you look at an Exodus sign; it's kind of like someone rewrote it. And so, it's it's the Exodus coming out of Egypt. The biggest number numbers in Deuteronomy. Well, those are Leviticus. If you Take two seconds, you can find out it's boring and it's full of law. Deuteronomy is speeches. Numbers is, it's a book of numbers. It's an accountant's version of who all was there. What comes after Deuteronomy? Ah, the next period of Old Testament history. So we've kind of moved through all this time period. We've gotten to the promised land. That's Deuteronomy is Moses's final speech to, to the people before they enter into the promised land. By the way, Moses doesn't make it. Oh, yeah, Joshua first. We for, forgot Joshua. He's like, he, I like that guy. Anyways, you get through Joshua. That's the conquest of the land. Then you get to Judges. We see this falling away. You get to the time period of the Kings, and that's 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Amen. And you get you start picking up the prophets at this point. But then you have this material here. So as daunting as the Old Testament may seem, the history of the timeline is really that simple. And the prophets lived prior to the Assyrian captivity, through the Babylonian Persian captivity, and to the return back to where they rebuilt, which is the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's the story of the rebuilding of the temple, rebuilding of the wall. Number six, according to Dr. Lewis, Christ's first coming and the beginning of the church are important subjects of Old Testament prophecy. Um, you get this from primarily from New Testament sources. Romans chapter one, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostle, set apart from the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets. So Paul is already aware that the prophets are writing about the coming Christ. Acts chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, there's this realization from the New Testament authors that the prophets were writing with the goal of foreshadowing who Christ was going to be and the message that he was going to preach. So this idea of, of what they're writing about, that's something that the New Testament authors will look back to. And that's why I say you always look at what the, uh, the uh, book was writing to initially. But if Paul quotes Joel and says, well, this is what Joel was meaning, who's smarter, Miss Betty, me or Paul? I think Paul is too. Yeah, I think Paul is too. And we can always assume that Paul is going to be more intelligent on a matter than what Josh or anyone else is going to say. Number seven. God's final revelation is made in his son, Jesus. Book of Hebrews would say, this is Hebrews 1. Long ago, many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But then these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. 
That's the reason the New Testament will say that that which was spoken by the prophets is considered to be as conclusive of a prophetic message of who Jesus is. Now, I'm going to kind of venture away from Dr. Lewis's material for a moment and kind of move into really uh, just some, some of the thoughts that I want to leave you with. First one, and this one actually does come from Dr. Lewis's book, is the reality that a prophet is a man who is called by God. Um, the word prophet has two interpretations, two possible renderings. And so as we kind of look at this, it's either the one who is the called one. So like the prophet is the called one or the prophet is the one who calls out. Um, they don't really know which one's the correct interpretation of it. But if you ask me, I think it's probably a little of both. The prophet is the called man by God who is called to call people out of the sin that they dwell within. We do see that there are prophets who are of false gods. You remember Elijah when he's up on the Mount Carmel? He was entertaining the prophets of Baal or Baal, however you choose to say that. <coughs> There are false prophets within the Bible, and there are false prophets who seem to even have the ability to foretell some things. Um, so the name for a prophet is the same on both accounts. We're kind of coming into this reality that ultimately a prophet, and the ones we have here, so I'll focus on the ones here, are ones who are called out by God to call people out. Now, on minor prophets versus major prophets, we have this distinction of major versus minor. Um, I want to make it clear that they are not minor in the sense of unimportant. It's not that they're not valuable uh, because there is a significant message there. Um, I think there's a distinction that's made between the major and the minor prophets. And so we kind of conclude that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel had something of greater importance to share. Even though we quote a lot of Isaiah, we quote a lot of Ezekiel and Daniel, but that's really a poor, uh, that may be a poor word and a poor verbiage is not the right phrase, but it would be poor on our part to assume that the minor prophets are less important because they're minor. They are minor because of their size. How long is Isaiah? 66 is it 66 or 63 I mean it doesn't matter it's 60 some 66 we'll say how long does it take you to read Ezekiel how long is Jonah four chapters you can read Jonah pretty easily these are minor prophets for one sole purpose. They ain't got much written there. They're just shorter writers. They got said in the quicker time what needed to be said than what the major prophets did. There you go. That's a funny way of saying it. Sometimes they were in the same time period. They were. Yes, yeah, sometimes their time periods are overlapping here. Uh, matter of fact, I... Um, I do kind of have a little chart that I had intended to print and then I forgot to print. Um, but um, there's a, I'll print that. I'll make it available to you. We might email it out so you can see it, but there's a chart that's available for um, what these men, like the time period that each of these writers wrote in. And so what we really see is that the early Assyrian period, which is the ninth century was Obadiah, Joel and Jonah. That's kind of the time period, and, and I'll make this clear. Joel and Obadiah, we're assuming those dates. There's also some people who would say they wrote around the, the fourth, the fifth century BC. So I don't really know exactly. I wasn't alive then. But we go from the early Assyrian period, which you're you're talking at this point, really the 800 BC plus. But then you move to the Assyrian period, which is Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, and Nahum. And they wrote in the 700s. Um, now, there's an interesting thing that we probably need to point out. Does anyone know what happened in 722 BC? Or 720, depends on how you date it. 
the Assyrian captivity, the northern tribe. That becomes an important point. The prophets were riding either to northern or to southern tribe, like northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. Northern being Israel, southern being Judah. And so as the prophets were riding, they were riding to, tri to tribes that were in trouble, about to be conquered. Um, the Assyrian captivity began in 722 BC. That's when Israel was pulled into captivity. Um, there are some other dates that really come up that are going to be highlighted, uh, but probably the next one that I would say is important is, um, let's see, 722, what is it, 6? Uh, oh, 586 B.C., there we go. 586 B.C. was the destruction of Jerusalem. That really kind of marks the conquest of the southern tribe. <clears throat> Um, so to kind of give you some idea, that's the time period we're dealing with. And these prophets go from the ninth century to the fifth century, Malachi being the last one to be written. Questions so far? I'm just like throwing information at you. Is everyone like... Five quick points, and these are these are my points that I'd leave you with. If I'm looking at the prophets, there are five things that I think probably apply to us that apply to them. The first one is that in a day when the world's events were uncertain and their meanings were difficult to comprehend, the minor prophets remind us that God is in control. We live in a world today that's equally unknown. I don't know tomorrow what the gas price is going to be. They say it's about to go up. I don't know. They tell us that the, war, the wars and rumors of war, you know, the Russia, Ukraine, and how that's affecting Europe and how that's going to affect them, how that is affecting us, all of this stuff. Our whole world is full of things that we really have no control over. Cancer. Death. Sickness. These are things we have no control over. The prophets lived in a world very similar to that. They had no control. But who does? So the minor prophets challenge us to gain a prophetic vision for the world, to see the way God works. Number two, in a day when the famine of God's word was real, the minor prophets remind us that God still speaks. The minor prophets are writing to a group of people who often did not know their Bibles. They were very ignorant. And if they even, if they knew their Bible, they knew it here, but they didn't know it here. And so the minor prophets are writing to a group of people who did not know their God. I think that's a challenge for us today. Because how well do we know our God? You'll notice, too, that the minor prophets, you're going to see a lot of the phrase, thus says the Lord. They spoke on the behalf of God. We live in a world today, I'm guilty of it, too, of, well, this is what I feel my religion should be about. This is what I feel. This is what I think. But the ability by myself or even other brothers and sisters in Christ to say, this is what the Lord says is lacking. The prophets did that. Number three, in a day of unfaithfulness, there were prophets, the minor prophets remind us of God's faithfulness. We see a great um, resign from church today, uh, a great resign from faith today. Think of church attendance. I'll use that. That's a, that's a measurable number, but think of church attendance from 1960 to today. The projection is that it's going to continue to decline. If you go and you poll young folks, folks my age, you know, 
it's interesting that the poll will show that a majority of them will believe in God, but will have no desire to have a connection to an organized religion or to an organized faith. You do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. And at the end of it, I'm sure that God will work it out. That's kind of the mentality. And in some ways, I can't fault people my age for that because organized religion has not always been the, the pillar of uh, goodness that it should be. But in times when even this church was pushing 600 folks on a Sunday to a, a number count today, we see decline. In a world that is unfaithful, the minor prophets remind us of God's faithfulness. God has made promises, and the promise that he makes in the minor prophets is that you will be taken care of, you'll be provided for, and you will return to a land that I have promised you. I will take care of you. And I think that's confidence for us. Point number four, in a day when religion is fake and empty. In a day when religion is fake and empty, the minor prophets call us to have a genuine faith and genuine religion. The minor prophets were full of people who went to church on Sunday, but their hearts were no different. They went, they did their stuff. They sacrificed, but they allowed the sacrifice to substitute the sacrifice of their life. As James would say, pure and undefiled religion is this, to take care of widows and orphans, to love those people who are oppressed by society, oppressed in general by life. Mm -hmm. The minor prophets challenge us to live a life of genuine faith. They call us out from the world that we live in, to live in a world that God intends us to live in. Point number five, in a day of minimal commitments, the minor prophets remind us that a life set apart by God is the best life spent. In a day of minimal commitments, the minor prophets remind us that a life spent dedicated to God, set apart by God, is the life well spent. Our world pulls us in so many directions. Many of you are retirement or near retirement age, and so the world may pull you less so. I don't know. I've heard people say that when you get retired, you work more than you worked when you was working. So I don't know how that works, but I know Roger stays busier than he cares to be. But as a 35-year-old, I know the world pulls in various directions. Somehow I have to maintain a marriage. I have to raise a kid, two kids. I have to make enough income for my own family to live. I have to make enough to plan for retirement. Oh, by the way, somewhere in all of this, I have to, to do good works and serve. And I have to do it. You know, the world pulls us in every direction. In a day when it's hard to commit to anything. The minor prophets remind us that if you've committed to God, if you've committed wholly to him, that that really is the secret of a life well spent. Some of these prophets will have unpleasant lives. But I don't know if they would change the thing about it. The minor, the major prophets are very easy to find. The minor prophets are less so to find on the the horrific details of their life. One that I read just a few days ago, I was looking up the date for Obadiah. I was trying to make sure I had a good day, an understanding of Obadiah. And um, the, the commentary I came across said that Obadiah was a very wealthy man. It was assumed that he was of the, uh, one of the lead charge in Ahab's household. And that he spent all the money that he had, even went in debt to feed prophets of God in a time period when there was oppression of the prophets. Now, whether that's the Obadiah of our Bible or the Obadiah of 
First Kings, Second Kings, whatever Ahab lived. I don't fully know through the same Obadiah. However, I do know this. A life spent with God is a life well spent. Any cl- comments or questions before we close? Thank you so much. Have a wonderful time in worship. I will email out that chart so that way y'all can kind of see the, the time period and the timeline that we're dealing with.